We're going to look at Galatians 3, and we'll start with verse 18 and go to the end of the chapter. We will make a little progress today, I think, on this on this uh, logic that Paul is showing us in this chapter. But let's refresh our memory by reading it. So I'll just read verse 18 and following. I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. For if the inheritance comes through the law, it no longer comes from promise, from the promise, but God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made. And it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. You can tell, let me interrupt myself, looking at these verses, just verses 19 and 20. If we stop and think about the, the content in these sentences and the way the sentences are put together, the syntax, it's as if there's some kind of conversation going on that we, we're not hearing the whole conversation. We're just picking up the part that we're reading here. I mean, one question that comes to mind is what what's this talk about angels and mediator? And why, if if there's more than one party, why then the reference to God as one? You 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 see, we get we get it, it's we we're hearing something, but we're not hearing the whole thing. It's as if we're not hearing the whole thing. So just want us to notice that kind of it. If when you read those verses, I know I do, when I read these verses, I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? It's a little hard to figure out. All right, verse 21. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. Meganoito is the Greek here. So may it never be. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ, in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Well, we're still in this detailed logic argument that Paul so characteristically does. And I will now share the screen with you so that we can get started. All right, verse 18, remember... The inheritance idea is, is, uh, is where we were. He was talking about a will, last will and testament, and how that works. And he uses that analogy to refer to Abraham's promise received from God comes long before the law. So the, the will of God, the testament of God, is shown in the promise to Abraham which changes the priority of the law. It puts the law in a particular status relative to the promise. That's Paul's claim. That's his argument. Well, then it raises a question about why the law, which is what we see in verse 19. And, it, and we learn that it was added because of transgressions. So my question added to what? As you think through this, 
what what sort of answers come to mind? And we're just thinking out loud now, maybe even speculating a little bit. But what do you think? What is it? What does added mean? And by the way, if your version says something different from that, gives a different angle on it, go ahead and say what your version says here. Anything different? Ooh. Well, I take it you, you're not getting anything there. So, so then let me back to the question added to what? Uh, I'm asking us to follow the logic in this, in this text here. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm added to just the general way. I mean, the, the law was put out there to tell us how to act. So added to the, the rules that people had put together or whatever societal norms they had, or we needed, we needed more. And that's why we got the law. It was added to human behavior, which okay. was, can be not very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Was it yes. added to the uh, promise of Abraham? Yeah, I think I think a little more directly. That's the that's the logic here. So uh, I agree with Sue. The law is added because we we needed governing. There's a purpose of the law that goes beyond the narrow focus that Paul has right at this moment. But so, yeah, Mark, that's what I was noticing that. We have the promise first, and then the law gets added. What I want us to notice here is that we, we are seeing played out in real time, so to speak, an argument about history and how God is acting in history. And when Christ comes, history changes. Now, this creates a challenge for Jews. Jews who believe in Jesus have to rethink everything. Jews who don't believe in Jesus, they can carry on with the way they've been interpreting the law. I think we should also always keep in mind that in the Jewish community large, at large, arguing about what the law is and does is a, is a regular part of the practice. And during this time we're looking at, there are different groups of people who regard the law somewhat differently. They all agree the law comes from God and that it is, the, it is the expression of the covenant that they, the people of God, have with God. But how to interpret particular aspects of it, that's a constant conversation and debate among the Jews. So what, what Paul is doing here in arguing it out this way is very characteristically Jewish. I think we should just keep that in mind. Even though he's bringing the innovation of recognizing Jesus as their Messiah, he's still thinking and operating very much in a Jewish mode. And so the law gets added to the promise. And that's why Paul is making this argument about that puts the law in a certain light because it, it doesn't take priority over the promise. So let's look at the promise and what the promise actually means that's what he's that's what he's saying there all right also in verse 19 until the offspring would come i'm i'm really going deep in a way i'm going very focused maybe is a better way of saying it very uh very slowly about a particular point. So to, to get at this, let's go back quickly and you can do with this without me reading it. But if you go back and look at verses 15 down through 18 and see what Paul is saying about the offspring. All right, Paul is making a case that the offspring is singular, not plural, and that the offspring is Christ. 
So as I mentioned last week or maybe the week before, there's a chance that Paul is using a particular aspect of Roman inheritance law. When, when a person makes a will, that person could envision someone besides just the immediate inheritors. The, the person making the will could look down the road to for other generations uh, descending from the inheritors. And that idea may have been useful to Paul in thinking about how the promise to Abraham and his seed was really a promise to Christ. Who comes obviously much later than Abraham. But now we come back to verse 19. Notice how it's written. Again, I'd like to know other versions and how it is stated here. But in the New Revised Standard, it says, until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made. And the, the, the word literally here is seed, sperma, seed, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Could you share your version? How does your version read? Is it pretty close to that? My version has one exception and it was, and it is until the offspring should come. Okay. What version is that, Joni? ESV? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Different. Mine is mine is the uh, Good News Bible, and it says uh, it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, to whom the promise was made. Okay, that's interesting, Gail. Because so the the Good News Bible takes out the conditional or the subjunctive. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, it puts it back in the in the indicative um, voice. Or mood, excuse me, indicative mood. Um, okay, we we won't we won't get too mired in grammar here, but that is interesting to note. Okay, so let me go ahead and ask this question then. Uh, the receiver of the promise we've determined is Christ. I think it's worth asking because there's a deep implication here emerging, I believe. How is this promise made? And when is it made? Anybody want to think out loud with me on this? Hmm. Well, maybe this is like too obvious of an answer, but isn't that is the promise that was made to Abraham before he had any before when his name was Abram? I mean, before he before anything had happened, really. That's true, and and that stays in place. It, it, we that is you're right. It is established that the promise is to Abraham, but but. Paul is really pressing the logic here, and I'll just say the vision, the realization of who Christ is. So if, the, if, we, if, if we leave the promise to Abraham in place, we're not trying to change it or negate it in any way. But if the promise is to Christ... How is that promise made? <laughs> Steve, I don't know that this is related to the question you're just asking, but yeah. he, he makes a very specific point of saying that the promise was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Yes. We will get to that because there is... Um, I'll just say now, there's a traditional Jewish understanding that the law was given by angels. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures there. And the mediator is Moses. 
Um, but, but again, Paul is that that's the part of the conversation I was alluding to earlier that we don't really get that, but that's, that may have been what people were saying to Paul as a way of buttressing their part of the argument in favor of circumcision. The law has a divine source. In other words, it came through angels. So we don't set aside the law. We don't do what they're accusing Paul of doing, which is to you're setting aside the law by setting aside circumcision. These Gentiles need to be circumcised because the law says that, right? So that that's what's going on there. And I think it's hard for us to pick up on it because I really do think in this case, we're getting only half of the conversation. All right. Was, Steve, was, me, was it through was it through Christ's crucifixion though that the that the promise was made then for all men? Well, all everything we're saying here, and you, you all know I'm trying to lead you someplace, so just bear with me, be patient with me for a second. Yes, so that's the crucifixion and the resurrection signal this entirely new way of understanding what God is doing, entirely new way from the standpoint of Jewish history, even though they had had the promise of the Messiah, it's Christ's nature as Messiah. That's what changes everything. As we've talked many times, the Messiah is a political figure who comes in to take over, to overthrow Roman oppression and to really establish the kingdom of God as the Jews envisioned it. Christ coming to die as Messiah, that made no sense to anybody and not Saul who becomes Paul until he has to work this all out. So that's key. The, the question I'm trying to get us to think about now is who, what is the nature of the person who receives the promise? Let me go parallel here or sideways for a second if we were to look at other scriptures in paul's writing like christ is the wisdom of god and the power of god we start to see in the new testament glimpses of spirit-led reflection on the nature of christ as sharing in the divine nature Christ as the wisdom of God and the power of God. Christ being given the title Lord. That's the name of the one God, Yahweh, Lord. In a Jewish perspective, the Lord is Yahweh. And here, Christ is given that title in the, in the New Testament, in the, the scriptures that we're alluding to now. So if, if the promise ultimately, with regard to ultimate purpose, is given to the second person of the Trinity, then how is that promise given? And when? That promise is if, given. If it were given that way, uh, if, if it's given to, to Christ himself, it would have been given in eternity past. It had always, it would have always been there because God is, is, is outside of, of this universe. He's outside of time and space. And, and I mean, the, the rest of the Bible eternity seems past. to indicate that it's, it's, uh, Term. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I missed something. That sounded like Gail's voice, maybe. I don't know if Gail wanted to say something. Oh, am I on? Am I on mute? No, oh. you're not muted. Oh, <laughs> surprise! Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just commenting on eternity past. That's a yeah. great term. Yeah. And I was reading uh, verse sixteen, where it says God made His promises to Abraham and to his descendant. Right. But right. it. It could be that it's way before that in eternity past. Well, that so I do want to I want to take good care here not to make the Bible say more than it says at this point. So that's why we keep 
firmly in place that in, in Galatians 3, we are observing uh, an argument about history and things do happen in a certain sequence. And yet, when we start looking at other places in Paul's writings and in the New Testament, we are witnessing the emergence of an understanding of the nature of God that has implications. So history still plays out sequentially. But for example, just, just going off script here a little bit, let's go back to chapter two of Acts. In chapter two, I'll have to find the verse. It's verse 23. Acts chapter two, verse 23. Here's another little glimpse. The context here is the day of Pentecost and, and Peter is preaching to the crowd that gathered. And we can imagine that, that at least some, perhaps many in that crowd, witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus 50 days earlier because they were, they, they very well could have been part of the, the crowd or the mob. All right, Acts 2.23. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. We, we have to hold things in tension here. History actually matters. History is filled with people making decisions, human actors, agents. And yet, at the same time, God is working out his plan. So the crucifixion of Jesus, part of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Something's going on here. We, when we think about what's in the mind of God, as God shows us what's in his mind, we see that without turning us into robots, nonetheless, God is playing out his eternal plan. In, in that light, when we come back to Galatians 3, this promise is made in eternity, as Richard pointed out, to the second person of the Trinity. Now, this may seem a little weird, uh, unnecessarily speculative, but I, I think I'm on solid ground here in in trying to bring to light a way of interpreting scripture based on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus that inevitably reveals this kind of logic. And I do like to think historically in the sense of imagining these first Christians who are Jews, now with the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the spirit, these, these historic events plus their experience with Jesus, with the risen Christ, and now having to go back to the scriptures, as I've said so often, they've got to go back to the scriptures that they have at that point, which we now call the Old Testament. And they're reading things oh so differently now. They're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy that in Christ, what God had promised from many ages ago, many years ago, uh, these things are now happening. And it just opens up a dimension of reflection and all, dare I say revelation because God shows these things over time of, of what God is actually doing. Now, I'll say this one more thing then I'll stop because I'd really like to know what you're thinking. The interesting thing about it is that when we read Galatians, there's nothing that immediately appears to lend itself to the kind of reflection that I ask us to do here these past few minutes. 
In other words, I could say there's no Trinity in here. You know, Rankin, you're just you're just reading into it. And yet, when we slow down and notice the little bit, um, I'll, I'll use the word pointed. The pointed way this this statement is made in verse 19. I think that getting us to slow down a little bit and then looking at other scriptures and beginning to think. The idea that God is the father is making this promise to the second person of the Trinity in eternity fits well with what Paul has said about the historical sequence. And it fits theologically with, with, with what Christians believe about the nature of God. Okay. So there I've, I've dumped a whole bunch of stuff on the table. Anybody, anybody want to respond? <laughs> I'll respond. <laughs> so the, the, um, in verse 19, when I, I mean, all the time when I have read this and maybe you made this point and I kind of missed it, but, um, why then the law, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. I always understood the, that, that to whom the promise had been made refers to Abraham. Yeah, but it's to the it's to the offspring, right? Well, I don't know. I feel like it's it in a way it's what I've understood it to say was it was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to that person Good who person. The, to whom the promise had been made, which was yeah. back to Abraham. So that 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 the promise being made to to the second person of the trinity right. is like is that i don't know i'm not doubting that's what it's saying uh, although I, and steve i i, I let me just ask this look at yeah. verse 16 doesn't it say the promise is made to both abraham and to his seed so yes so it's a it's a it's a promise to to both Oh goodness! Uh, the 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 I guess there are two recipients. I, I was right. going to try to make a little finer distinction. I'm not sure I can immediately come up with one. Uh, if you'll give me a week or so. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> the the it, it, anyway, I, I think it's to both. And and so your interpretation, Joni, is not is not wrong. I would just suggest maybe it's incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the punctuation here, and I, you know, I know that was added later, and that's someone's interpretation. Uh -huh. But in the ESV, um, it was added because of transgressions, comma, uh -huh. until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, comma, and it was put in place through angels. Yeah. So to me, that specifically said that we're talking about the offspring to whom the promise was made all in one little little phrase there, because that's the way they interpreted it anyway. I mean, I know I'm being picky with grammar here, but you know, that's kind of the point of all the punctuation marks is it makes it easier to understand. So I feel like at least the people that, that put together the ESV thought that we were talking about promise to the descendant as right. opposed, I mean, to both, but yeah. Um, I know the promise was made to both, but I, I feel I feel like this verse is talking yeah. about the descendant. Uh, yeah, I think so, too. And it, uh, and it is good to refer back to verse 16. Thank you, Richard. So the promise is to Abraham, but it's also to the offspring, to the descendant, to the seed. Um, and uh, the 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 two prepositional phrases that we find in verse 19 cause us to think about what is the object of the preposition and again we're, we're we are deep in grammar but here's the thing it's this kind of attention to detail that sometimes reveals these moments where we we start to it's like another room in the house opens up for us uh, and you can 
you can see, again, thinking historically about Paul's wrestling through to these conclusions, what would it have been like for him to start to understand the promise made to Abraham in this way that he's now explaining to us? From a Jewish point of view, traditionally, it was seen as a massive innovation. And I think Paul would say, yep, it sure is. That's what the coming of Christ has done. That's the historical mm -hmm. argument part. If we start to think about what it reveals about God's nature, if we're seeing God truly is Trinity, then the implication is when the promise is made, the father is promising the son, his inheritance. And his inheritance is both Jew and Gentile. This is really stunning, I think, in certain ways. Um, I, and I feel like I'm not doing a good job of getting a, the, my point across. But hopefully, maybe at least in a little way, we can see just how cosmos altering this understanding actually is. Any other thoughts there? Uh, yeah, Steve, uh, in the NIV version I'm looking at, it, it says, uh, because transgressions until the seed, and it's capitalized, to whom the promise referred had come. Exactly. So then NIV makes it very clear that that the interpretation is Christological, to say it that way. So the seed capitalized, that's referring specifically to Christ. Yeah. But Mike, okay. did you say the seed to whom the promise referred instead of the seed to whom the promise was made? You're correct. To whom the promise referred. That's a different yeah, that's that's the interpretation. Area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's and interpretation I, there. Yeah, that's exactly. That might be a little overreach. We could put it that way. It's not wrong, but in in terms of what the text actually says, it might be a little too much interpretation, a little bit of an overreach. Okay, can I ask some some questions here? Sure. Because of transgressions. What? What are we talking about? Transgressions, transgressions against the natural law, the law written on men's hearts. This, 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 the, 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 the kind of set of principles we all carry around with us and whine about when we say things that we're three-year-olds and say it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I, 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 I mean, to, to me, this is kind of a, Well, I look at it a certain way. I, I, I see this. So until the law, which was 400 and whatever it was, 20 years after the, the Abrahamic promise, uh, we, we, we all carried around with us this, this natural law written in our hearts. You know, we know to be courageous is good. To be a coward is, is bad. We, we know to kill is to, to murder is bad. We know to steal is bad. We know to treat other people in, in a way different than we want to be treated is is bad. Well, that that if, if that is written on our hearts by by uh, our Creator, then it wasn't working. And transgression the the transgressions of the in this case I guess the Semitic people uh, uh, said, well, okay, well, well, if this isn't showing them the difference between them and their, their need and their dependence upon me, and I'm speaking in the, as if I were God, uh, if, if it, if it, then, then I'm going to make it, I'm going to reveal more of myself than just by this, 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 this group of, of uh, this nat natural law. And I'm going to, 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 to show that through the law. And I'm going to show them that when they fail to keep it, and they surely will, that uh, when they fail to keep 
the Mosaic law, then, then, then they, they certainly shows that, that they have to become aligned with me and meet the Mosaic promise and all. And so we can stay together. I mean, this is, this is, this is kind of a really amateurish way to say this, but uh, I see all that in, in these, these few verses. And I, I could certainly be wrong because I, <laughs> I bring a lot of stuff to the table when well, I read something. Yeah. So transgression, it's good to ask, what is, what is he talking about there? And I think this is where N.T. Wright helps us see the development. Again, I'm thinking historically, the development in Paul's thinking. Galatians is written, as it were, in the heat of this controversy in the late 40s, maybe around 50. The book of Romans, a few years later, with more time to think, and continued study, prayer, reflection has a more uh, less kind of controversial and more straightforwardly theological uh, explanation. So I invite you on this point, let's go to Romans chapter two and look at verse 12. And, and we're seeing in Paul's reflections exactly what you're talking about there, Richard, at least as I understood it, and, and, and more than, I think, is we are talking about both Jew and Gentile, Romans 2, 12. All who have sinned apart from the law, those are the Gentiles. So the law written on our hearts, the natural law, just as you said, Richard, all who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And the point here is both Jew and Gentile wind up in the same place, either just the, to use the term natural law, just because the natural law as non-Jews condemns us and the Mosaic law for Jews condemns them. So transgressions back in Galatians 3, I think can cover both of those categories of people because that's the argument Paul is making here as he shows us down in the conclusion, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We all stand in the same place under the law, whether it's Mosaic law or natural law, we all stand in the same place and we all stand in the same place under Christ. And the conclusion for Paul is, so don't you go making those Gentiles get circumcised and adhere to the law, because what you're doing then is you're saying Christ isn't necessary. You're going to put them back under the bondage of the law. And let's be honest, fellow Jews, we all fail at following the law. That's where the argument goes. Well, shall we press so How do you on? think Paul came up with this? What? So that, what? It, what? This is this is this is so radical. It is. Well, my my answer in a nutshell, the straightforwardly to that question is, I think because Paul is driven back to searching the scriptures that he knew so well, and now having experienced the risen Christ, he sees those scriptures differently, and he sees other scriptures that maybe he had not attended to properly. Uh, like the fact that really the Old Testament says, Jews are hard-hearted people. The people of God are hard-hearted people and they're not going to be able to keep the law. I'm giving them the law, but they're not gonna be able to keep it. That's the conclusion he comes to from reading the scripture. But I also have to say that while he does this work and it's his, it's his theological training, it's his experience, it's everything about Paul as a person, humanly speaking. I also think God is teaching and guiding and directing to help Paul come to this conclusion. So it's, it's always this combination of divine and human action that results in a stunning picture, honestly. And of course, then the, the implication that always comes to my mind is either this is 
gloriously true or it's offensively false. And there's not a lot of middle ground here. I'm talking about just basic claims now about Christ and the nature of God and all that. So it's either so, gloriously true or it's offensively untrue. So Paul is, Paul is, is, is oh, how do you say this? Filled with the spirit. Yes. When he is doing these things and it is the spirit and Paul working together. I guess that's a sign of a, he came to a Christian maturity fairly quickly then, didn't he? He's got three years here since uh, three and a half, four since uh, the road to Damascus. And, and here he is. I mean, this is a pretty brilliant theologian. Right. And the, the neat thing there is that he doesn't negate everything about his former life. Compared to Christ, his former life is rubbish, but he builds on his theological training and all that. Paul doesn't stop being Jewish when he becomes a follower of Jesus. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so it's, it's a, in that sense, God honors all the work Paul had been doing, but, but he radically alters the understanding of the work Paul had been doing. And I think that's good for us to think about our own experience in, in growing in Christ. Uh, we don't, even though I, I sometimes com complain about my theological training and stuff like that, God has used it, you know, and it's been, it's been a valuable part of my experience in the ministry. We can all think along those lines. One other thing that it seems like to me, Paul had kind of an advantage is after uh, Jesus died on the cross, that's when the Holy Spirit came down. So uh, a lot of this revelation might have been, and you know how Paul went off for a long time right. to try to uh, figure out the interpretation. I think the Holy Spirit, and we have it too, uh, helps guide us in ways that we, we couldn't figure out on our own. Yeah, and that's a good, uh, it's a good, rev go back to Galatians 3.2. You're, you're right, Mark, and this becomes this becomes a major theological foundation point. It's not only experience, it's it's really about the way God is operating. Did you receive the spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? And then verse uh, five. Does God supply you with the spirit? and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law and so on. So that is an experiential reference there, but it's also theological. God is showing himself to be Trinity. And that's the new thing. We're not using the word Trinity yet, but as we've talked about when we studied Mark, when Jesus acts, we see God acting and in John, Jesus sends the Spirit, but the Spirit is also from the Father. And the, the scriptures are revealing piecemeal, in a sense, what we come to understand as God's nature as Trinity. Well, you're outlining the, 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 the importance of, of the, the, the church, the body of Christ, because without the intermingle or that without the, the 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 communal symbiotic relationship of of individual christians i don't think uh some of these doctrines ever would have been developed uh, they there if, if you go back and read some some of the the books i've read before i mean these these early notions of the first four centuries or so were uh really remarkable in how they were kind of worked out and, and argued over and right anyway I yeah yeah I agree it's it's truly amazing and the again I think there's an implication for God's nature and the way God acts that God would risk collaborating with human beings on these points is truly amazing now we also know that god can do what he wants uh 
and he's shown that many times across the centuries. At the same time, when God created human beings in his image, there clearly is a purpose for humans to co-labor with God and God, therefore, co-laboring with humans. And your point, Richard, about these early leaders of the church who hammer out the basic doctrines of the Christian faith, it's truly amazing. And there is a sense in which the Spirit of God keeps working to guide conversations and to shape the, the product of those early centuries in the way that it, it came out. Um, yeah, lots of implications there. Um, maybe, let's see, how are we doing here? I think we're probably about out of time. Let's press on and do one more since, since we referred to this thing about angels and a mediator. Verse 19 still. It, the law, was ordained through angels by a mediator. <clears throat> so let's look at a couple of other places where we see the notion of angels and mediator. Stephen's defense in Acts chapter 7. Hmm. Verse 53. Wow. It's a quick dial. Yeah. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. So Stephen's defense, this is a side note, is very much like Paul's argument. Stephen's defense, now he's on trial. He is saying, look, when you read the scriptures, he, Stephen, is saying to his accusers, when you read the scriptures, Old Testament, you see that we have never kept the law. We have been a hard-hearted people. And you have been hard-hearted. You are the ones that received the law, and yet you have not kept it. Same message. So there's the angels reference. That's, a, that's, that's an indication of a, a kind of common notion among Jews that the law of Moses was, was given to Moses by angels. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 5.5. 5. Here's the mediator picture. Deuteronomy 5.5. 5. At that time, I was standing between the Lord. Moses here, I was standing between the Lord and you, you all, to declare to you the words of the Lord. For you were afraid of the fire, didn't go up the mountain. There's a perfect illustration of what a mediator does. Standing between two parties to, to help communication, to do whatever needs to be done between the two parties. So in Galatians 3.19, Paul is working with a well-known idea among Jews about where the, how the law was given to God's people. Now, we don't have, we'll, we'll take this up next week. We don't have too much time to go on, but I do want to get to that next point still in this, in this particular bullet point. The purpose for the law then for followers of Jesus. And what I want to do next time is tell you a little bit about Marcion and Marcion's canon and some of the modern ways of thinking about law from a Christian point of view that, that tend to be a little bit like Marcion's view. So let's start looking at once we have Christ, what is the purpose of the law ongoing? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, 8. Nine, eight.
again, we, as always, we're breaking into the middle of an argument and the topic is not germane for us at this point, but see what Paul does. He references the law in arguing a certain way on the, on the point. Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law say the same? So you can see Paul here is using the law as, as a kind of ethical guidance. All right, we'll come back to this next week. What I'm trying to do at this point is to help us think about the ongoing relevance of the law. The coming of Christ does not abrogate everything about the law, even though we're seeing we, we, we as good Jews, were we good Jews, we need to rethink in a quite radical way what the law actually did and does for us. Once we are in Christ, we can, in a sense, take up the law again, but in a much for a much different purpose than how the people in the Galatian churches were using the law to force Gentiles effectively to become Jews. So that that has all kinds of implications that Paul's been talking about and uh, piecemeal, piecemeal, as we keep working with these questions we're working on that I think that. That, that bigger argument starts to become even more clear. All right. Any last words? <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> I, I hope to see you again. <laughs> right. You, you let me know, would you? You can... Call me, email me, text me, however you want to do it. Let me know, though, if you have other questions that either we don't get to or you don't want to bring up in the class, please do let me know uh, any questions or concerns you have, because we can we can talk about this during the week, too, not just on Sunday. Steve, I think you're talking to everybody else because Richard and I seem to have no trouble <laughs> bringing, up, bringing up anything. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's all great. I mean, yeah, it's all good. Okay, let's pray. We are always grateful, Lord, for the privilege of thinking together, for the depth of the scriptures. And we continue to ask for guidance that we would understand them properly and uh, that we would grow because of it. We know the people on our prayer list. Uh, and we know others on our minds and hearts that we don't necessarily share in, in the Sunday school class, but we are aware of them. And we look to you for healing and for strength and encouragement for all they need. And while we're waiting on you to answer, we pray that you'd help us walk faithfully in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, happy 4th, everybody. Happy 4th of July. Happy yep. fourth. Good luck with the orange range. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye.